Hi guys, and welcome back to Stranger Than Fiction. In an earlier video, I told you about black body radiation and how it was one of the first clues we had that something was missing in our understanding of physics. That something was quantum mechanics. If you haven't seen the video about black body radiation, I hope you'll give it a look. Unlike this video, it doesn't have much math in it, so it's a good introduction. But right now, what I want to do is show you how we got an important equation we talked about in that video. If you want to contribute discoveries of your own someday, which I hope you will, understanding how scientists use math is crucial. So I mentioned in that earlier video that Lord Rayleigh used the physics they knew about at the time to try to explain the energy given off by a heated object called a black body. He came up with this equation, called the Rayleigh equation, and here I want to explain how he came up with it. To start out with, we have to remember that light is a wave. Lots of us remember waves like this one from math or science classes we took as kids, and when we think about light waves, this is probably the picture most of us have. What we want to do is figure out how much of each color of light a black body gives off, and the color is determined by the length of the wave. So we want to know how much light of each wavelength, each color, the black body gives off. So picture the inside of a black body. It's got light waves bouncing around inside, in between the walls. Now suppose a wave starts out at one wall, say halfway up the wave, and when it gets to the other wall, the height of the waves at another point, maybe part way up the curve like this. Now when it bounces back, it's not going to ex exactly match the original wave. It's going to be out of sync a little. And when it bounces off the first wall again, it won't match up with either of the first two times. After a while, if you look at the waves that have gone back and forth, and pick a spot along the x-axis, you find out that half the time the wave is above the midway point, and half the time it's below it. So, if you add those waves together, they're going to cancel out. If you wanted to sound sciencey, you'd say the waves are destructively interfering. That's what happens to most waves if you just pick one at random and imagine it bouncing back and forth in a black body. So how do we prevent that from happening? The only waves that don't do that are waves that exactly retrace their steps when they make a lap across the black body. Remember how our wave was at a random height when it hit the far wall? That's where our trouble started. We started at the midpoint of the wave, so we need to make sure that it ends at the midpoint too, not at just any height. Well, if you start the wave at the midpoint, you get back to the midpoint again after you've gone through half of a wavelength. The wavelength is this symbol, the Greek letter lambda. So a wave only works if you can fit a whole number of those half waves in between the walls. So if the walls are a distance apart called L for length, the wave only works if L is a whole number of those half wavelengths. We'll call the whole number N. Now we're going to be interested in knowing what N is in a second, so let's rearrange this equation a little to solve for N. And one other thing. I chose the zero on the x-axis to be over here on the left side of the black body, but I could have chosen the zero to be over here on the right side. In that case, the value for L would have been a negative number. If we did do that, we wouldn't want it to mess up our equation, so we need to do something to make sure that we don't get a negative number just because we changed where the axis is. We can do that by squaring both sides of the equation. That way we always get a positive number on each side. Now you might have noticed that this wave is only on the x-axis. It's a one-dimensional wave. But one-dimensional waves aren't very realistic. Real waves have more dimensions. Ripples on the surface of a pond are a familiar example. Those are two-dimensional waves, so they can go in any direction across the surface of the water. And light waves are three-dimensional. Now, three-dimensional waves are harder to picture. What do they look like? Well, you might have seen some old movies that start with a logo for RKO pictures. The waves coming from that antenna are supposed to be three-dimensional waves. If you imagine those pulses going out in every direction, you get the idea. So since we're dealing with three-dimensional waves, we have to change this equation. Instead of just one term on the left, we'll have three, one for each of the three dimensions. One thing that's really not obvious is that n, the number of half waves, can be different in each of the three dimensions. So we need to make sure those three n's are three different symbols, nx, ny, and nz. You might wonder how n could be different in those three dimensions. It's hard to picture in 3D. So let's look at a 2D example. Here's a 2D wave. If you pick a random spot on this axis, 
say over here, you can see that the wave starts at zero, goes up to a peak, and then goes back to zero again. So in that dimension, there's one half a wave. The same thing's true if we pick a spot on the other axis, like this. The wave starts at zero, goes up to a peak, and goes back to zero. So in this example, nx is one, because there's one half a wave in that direction. And NY is also one. There's one half wave in each of the two dimensions. But now look at this wave. It's much different. If I pick a point on this axis like I did last time, I find the curve starts at zero, goes up, and then back down. So it has one half wave in that dimension, just like the first example. But in this dimension, the wave starts at zero, goes through a peak, and then back to zero, and keeps going. It goes through a minimum here, and it finally ends at zero again. So it has two half waves. That means nx will be one, but ny is going to be two. And here's an example that has two half waves in the x direction, one, two, and two in the y direction. So nx and ny are both two. You can imagine waves that have any combination of numbers for nx and ny. You could have a wave that goes up and down 20 times in the x direction and 100 times in the y direction. So nx and ny would both be pretty big numbers. So for a three-dimensional wave, like a light wave, we could have three different numbers for nx, ny, and nz in this equation. You'll notice I used l for the length in each of these three, which means the black body is going to have the same length, width, and height. So the black body is a cube. It doesn't have to be. We could make it any shape, but the math is much easier if we make the black body a cube. If we made it spherical or some other shape, we'd still get the same answer at the end, but we'd have to do a lot more math in order to get there. Now, believe it or not, we've actually done most of the work we have to do in order to get the Rayleigh equation. Before we finish, let's remember the big picture. What we're trying to do is we're trying to get an equation that tells us how much energy a black body gives off at each wavelength. To know that, we have to know how many different kinds of wave there can be inside the black body. So for example, there can be a wave where nx and y and nz are all equal to one. You could have another where nx and ny are one, but nz is two, and so on. There's lots of possible combinations, and those combinations are called nodes. So we want to know how many nodes there can be in the black body. That's not easy to find out, but it turns out the number of nodes, that's capital N, is equal to this. Here are our three N values, each squared and then added together. Then they're raised to this exponent, three halves, and it's all multiplied by pi over three. Now we can make this simpler because we already figured out that the stuff in parentheses here is equal to this, 4L squared over lambda squared. So let's put that in the parentheses. Now we can raise that to the exponent, 3 halves, and here's what we get. The number of modes, n, is equal to 8 pi over 3 times L cubed over lambda cubed. Now n is going to be different depending on the wavelength. So if we want to know how much of each color the black body is giving off, we have to know how the number of modes changes when we change the wavelength. To get that, we need to use calculus. What we're trying to figure out is the change in the number of modes, which in calculus you write as dn, so the change in the number of modes as we change the wavelength, dn over d lambda. Those of you who know a little bit of calculus know that what we're doing here is called taking a derivative. When you do that, here's what you get. So now we know the number of modes and how it changes with the wavelength. That means we're finally ready to figure out the energy. What we want to know is how the energy changes with the wavelength. So we'll use calculus again and write it as dE over d lambda, the change in the energy over the change in the wavelength. And we want to know this for the whole volume of the black body, so we're going to divide that by the volume, which is L cubed. So what is E, the energy? 
Well, each mode has an average energy of negative k times t, where k is the constant, called the Boltzmann constant, and t is the temperature. If we put that in for the energy, we finally have temperature in our equation. We always knew it was going to show up eventually because the whole reason we care about black bodies is that they give off light when you heat them, and we wanted to know how the temperature would affect the color of the light. So the energy is equal to the energy of a mode, negative kT, times the number of modes, n. So now this is our equation. But look, we already figured out what that term's equal to so we can put our earlier result into that part of the equation. And now things get much simpler. The minus signs and the L cubed terms all cancel out, and that leaves us with our answer. This is the equation for the energy a black body gives off at different temperatures. Now if you look back at the Rayleigh equation, you'll see that it's not the same as the one we just got. That's because the Rayleigh equation uses the frequency of the light given off but we got our equation using wavelength instead of frequency, because it's a little easier to figure out that way. But now we can convert from the wavelength of the frequency pretty easily. All we need to do is go back one step. Back here, we looked at the change in n with wavelength. If we multiply the right side by this additional term, the d lambdas cancel out, so it's like we get rid of the wavelength and replace it with the frequency. So, now that we've done that, we'll substitute our earlier value for dn over d lambda, just as we did the first time. Now, how do we get rid of this new fraction? Well, it turns out that the wavelength and frequency of light are connected. If you multiply them together, you always get c, the speed of light. So c equals a lambda times nu. Rearranging that a bit gives us this. Lambda equals c over nu. If we substitute that everywhere we see a lambda in our equation, we'll have replaced all the wavelengths by frequency. That gives us this equation. And now finally we can get rid of that fraction using calculus. When we do, we finally get the Rayleigh equation. But as I mentioned in the earlier video, it turns out, even though we've done all that work, this equation is wrong. The Rayleigh equation assumes that a black body can give off light with any energy, and today we know that that's not true. A better equation, which does take that into account, was discovered by Max Planck. And believe it or not, even though it's more accurate, Planck's equation is actually much easier to figure out than the Rayleigh equation was. If you're curious about Planck's equation, I hope you'll check out my video about it. Also, if you haven't seen the earlier non-mathematical video I made about black body radiation and why we care about it, I hope you'll give it a look too. Thanks for watching!